I hope you're having a great conference. Uh, my name is Pablo, and today I'm going to be talking to you about some tools that we use in Rappi that are helping us uh, adopt SwiftUI better, you know, in a, in a way that's scalable. So uh, be before going into the topic, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of what Rappi is. You know, especially for the people who do not live in Latin America, you probably haven't heard of Rappi before or don't know what Rappi, you know, is. Uh, we operate in uh, almost all the countries in the Latin America region, and we designate Rappi as the super app of Latin America. Uh, it's been around for seven years, and it being a super app basically means that there's, there's a lot of functionality. There's lots of stuff that you can do here. So you can use Rappi to do things that go all the way from ordering food from your favorite restaurants. You can shop for groceries. Uh, you can open a bank account in some countries and uh, order a credit card. You know, book hotel rooms and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of functionality in the super app. From the technical side, we are a team of more than 80 people that are working on the iOS app. Uh, five of those people are um, platform engineers. You know, I am one of those. And we focus on things like infrastructure you know, for, the, for the iOS apps to, to run smoothly, CI and that, that kind of stuff, as well as some of the tools that I'm, that I'm going to be showing to you uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the project has more than 2 million lines of sweet code, you know, so it's, it's a lot of code that we have to deal with. And, you know, just to give you a sense of how uh, fast things move, there's around, um, there's around 90 PRs that are merged to the develop branch every, every week. So, we you know, we have an overview of, this, of the scale of the company there. Now, going back to the topic of SwiftUI. So, we've been thinking about adopting SwiftUI basically since it came out, right, in 2019. Uh, for a few years, this was just not feasible for us because of, because of this guy, the deployment target. So you're probably familiar with you know, this issue. You, know, you, can jump, you cannot jump in right into the new technologies uh, as fast as you could because of, because of this. So in our case, we waited until uh, iOS 14, actually, you know, we, until we had the, um, the ability to update to iOS 14 in order to start adopting SwiftUI. Uh, so we just jumped over the iOS 13 update because we knew that we were going to update to iOS 14 very soon, and this allowed us, you know, we, we just skipped a lot of the issues that I hear people have with iOS 13 this way. So before starting to do this, we had to think of some kind of adoption strategy, right? So that, this is a good idea, I think, for teams that are uh, you know, big as ours. If, if we just told people, hey, you can just start using SwiftUI now, you know, just, and you probably somebody would have been able to, you know, write some view in SwiftUI, and even ship, even ship something, but the developer experience wouldn't have been very, very optimal, probably. So adoption strategy can uh, encompass lots of things. There's actually another talk tomorrow that's going to focus on some other aspects of this, but uh, today I'm going to just focus on two, of the, of, two of, the, of the aspects. So the first one would be some architectural changes that we did to our modular architecture, and uh, a couple of developer tools, okay? So, but before going into that, let me tell you a little bit about how our app is organized or how is it modularized. Uh, so as every big application or other big applications that I know, uh, our app is, is divided into modules. And then I'm going to give you, uh, you know, a small kind of uh, diagram that to, to, to show you that. So this would be the app target. There's actually not a lot of code in the app target, right? So it's mostly just glue code to connect the actual implementations that live in the uh, in these things that are, these would be different targets that are, we, we are going to be calling implementation modules. So this is where every team roughly implements all of their features in our, in our company. So at least this is how, how, th how things work before the, we started adopting SwiftUI. And we also have this additional layer of interface modules. So this is going to allow us to do dependency inversion at the module level, which I'm going to explain in a second. And then we have a dependency injection framework to kind of tie everything to get, together. And so you can imagine that in Rapid, there's going to be uh, teams like uh, restaurants, probably, and cart, right? So th those, those are two popular destinations in, in our app. And so I'm going to use those as an example. So the reason we have these interfaces is because we want to, you know, they, every team exposes their, their public API. So this is similar to what the Spotify guys were talking uh, before. So every team exposes their public API into the interface module. Uh, so these interfaces are very lightweight, they just contain a few protocols. 
that represent the, um, the API. And somewhere, sometime in the app's life cycle, the, you know, the, the, the dependency injection framework is going to be used in order to associate the protocols with implementations that live in the implementation modules. So this allows us to do this. So if restaurants wanted to use cart, you know, this uh, very common use case, uh, they can do that, you know, do, uh, use the, um, the functionality that they need from the cart team just by depending on their interface module. Right, they don't need to depend on the, um, on the actual implementation, and the, so they can just request the implementation for a particular protocol from the dependency injection framework. Uh, so that way, we avoid having like long dependency chains between these uh, heavy modules. You know that that would cause some issues. So, and if we have this kind of uh, structure, right, if if the apps organized this way, where would SwiftUI fit in this case? So if we just did business as usual, you can imagine that if, rest, if the restaurant's team wanted to implement their SwiftUI code, uh, they would add it there, right, in, in their existing um, implementation module. But how would the developer experience be in this case? So it probably wouldn't be optimal because that SwiftUI code is going to be mixed with, uh, different, like, with all of the code from restaurants, literally. All the screens, written UI kit, and you know, additional, additional business logic that's not relevant to the SwiftUI feature. And if they, so all that would have to be compiled if we wanted to do something like uh, build a preview, SwiftUI preview. And I know some people just don't, don't use SwiftUI previews and don't like them very much. But if, if, if someone in our, in our team wants to use them, they should be able to. And talking about previews, you know, those just wouldn't work with, under, this, um, under this, in this module because in our main project, everything is, or most of the modules actually are configured as static libraries. And SwiftUI, and any, any SwiftUI preview code that you put into static library is just not going to work. That's not support, support at the moment. So we saw this as an improvement opportunity. Uh, so we could do something about this to both improve the, uh, the way that the app is modularized, as well as give our developers and our, our people just a better developer experience. So again, as I said before, I'm going to focus on architectural changes here. So that's basically some, it's going to be the isolation of the suite UI code into smaller modules, you know, right? So you, so you probably saw this coming. And as well as well, some developer tools that are going to make it easy to create and work on, uh, on these modules. So let me just, you know, go, go into detail into those. So the first one is isolate suite UI code into smaller modules. So that means that instead of putting our, our code into the, into the existing code, into the existing module, excuse me, so for restaurants, we would create a new module for, for one feature, and that would be where the Swift UI code goes. Right, so in, in this example, that, that would be the uh, product detail feature. And then if we have this, this would be the, the an implementation module, right? So there would be actual concrete classes and structs there. So we can have this interface layer still. That's where everything's, the, the API is going to be exposed, and we, that's where the, the dependencies are pointed at. And over time, every team is going to have multiple of these, and you, know, every, you, can, you can think that every screen of a team is going to be implemented in one of these, um, one of these pairs of, of modules. So that's the first part. You know, that way, we just isolated the code into smaller modules. So the second part now. So we still have to make it easy to work and uh, create these switch UI modules, right? Because if a team, you can, you can imagine that if we're going to have this kind of pattern, then uh, it's going to be more frequent that teams have to create this, this pairs of modules. So if you wanted to create a new feature, you would actually need, you'd actually have to create these two modules. And you know, configure everything properly and put everything you know, in, the, in the right folders. And all, we could have some kind of tutorial to help people uh, to tell people how to do this, but this is a perfect uh, example for some automation. So we decided to write some a developer tool that uh, to help people use this and you know, give give them a better experience. So we uh, wrote a command line tool that we call Rappi Army Knife. That uh, this is basically written in all in Swift. And we we just call it Rack for short. Uh, we use this library. You know, we, by, the, by the way, if your team needs to, you know, you think that your team would benefit from some kind of command line tool. Uh, this is, I would recommend this because this makes it pretty accessible to just use your existing Swift knowledge to, to build a, a command line tool to automate things like this. So in our case, if we wanted to create these, uh, these pairs of modules, we, we built a command to do that. So this is how the command looks like. 
So we just tell our tool to build, uh, to build a module called product detail. In this case, you know, it's going to be the, uh, a feature type of module. And we also tell the team, because we want to keep track of, you know, of team uh, of code owners ownership. Now, uh, this is, of course, going to create the modules, but we also do some additional things, like, for example, target configuration. We know that the implementation module for this feature is always needs to depend on the interface. So we just add that dependency by default. We can also add some additional dependencies towards some of the design system um, modules, for example, that you know, we know every team is going to need. Uh, and we also took this opportunity to add some template generation here because uh, this is not required. We, the, the modules that we created could just be empty. But with, with using templates, we realized that we could um, first save people some time and also just nudge developers in the right directions towards the, you know, in, in terms of some formatting and some naming, naming conventions that we want to use. So here we include things like localization files, right? Um, so some, some strings files as well as some examples of how our localization API is used. We also do you know, generate and add to the, to the brand new feature module some, some types that are going to do the dependency injection registration with our, the dependency, the, the framework that we use. And we also add some Swift UI code and even some, some tests, right? So everything is configured, saves a lot of time. So, and that's what this command does. So that takes care of the creation part of this second point, but we still have to make it easy to work on these features or yeah, this, on these modules. Because you can imagine if we just embed that, you know, those newly created uh, modules in the, in the full project, then that kind of beats the purpose of it, right? So if you, you still have to compile everything. So what we want here is to have a, a scope that's way more reduced and it's focused on a single feature that allows us to compile, it, to compile only what's strictly necessary. So in this example, you can imagine that if this feature depends only on this interface and the network interface, let's say, right, to do some networking, so that's all that you really need to compile. And you're also going to need an app target that, um, you know, that wraps this and you know, lets you run it on the simulator and, or on your device. And instead of having the real implementation here for the network, for example, you could have some mocks that you feed the, uh, the dependency injection framework. So this is what we would be referring to as a development application. Right? So it's an app that we generate on demand that's focused on a single feature. And to do that, we created a second command. So this is how this command looks like. Uh, when you run it, it's going to package everything that you need into, uh, into uh, an application, and an, X, an XE workspace, and then uh, open Xcode. And you know, this is, these two commands are, have been designed in a way that you can run, run them in the, in the following way. So if, let's say, for example, you wanted to create uh, a new feature that's called Swiftable, right? Because let's say it's, uh, Rappi is secretly working on you know, making some kind of functionality to buy tickets for next year's Swiftable conference. And just, okay, just because it's Swiftable, my team is going to take care of that. So if I press enter here, then you know, the modules are going to be created successfully with all of the templates and the, the things that I mentioned before. And now if I run the second command you know, and I, I add this, this open flag at the end, then you know, the development application would get generated and Xcode would be open in front of me with, the, um, with all that I need to just start working on this feature. And as you can see here that you know, that, that's what my template for Swift UI could look like. Uh, we add here some examples of, you know, of the usage of our uh, localization API. And it's, it's just very simple. But as you see, this thing compiles already. You know, you, there's the preview there. And so the preview works because as we control the whole uh, the co creation generation of this project, then we can configure the, the frameworks or the, uh, the targets that need to be uh, dynamic frameworks as, as dynamic frameworks or anywhere where your Swift UI preview code uh, is located at. And that's what this second command does. So I'm not going to go into much detail of how, how this command works, right? So that was the initial intention of my talk, but I realized that's, t that's just too much information for a, for a short talk. But I'm going to uh, just mention, I just want, just want to share with you a, lot of, a, a few of the tools that we use as dependencies here to, to help us with some things. So first, for the Xcode project generation, we use this library code Xcodegen. 
which is an awesome library. I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, this lets you define an Xcode project in terms of a YAML file. And you can imagine that in the, in, in the context of a command line tool, it's going to be much easier to just deal with a YAML than with a real Xcode project. So then we also do some kind of code analysis. So we use Swift syntax to do this. Uh, there's going to be another talk in this conference tomorrow that's going to focus entirely on Swift syntax. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, but this basically lets us um, navigate through the abstract syntax tree, which is the output of the first step of the Swift compiler. And what that means in practical terms is that it lets you have some kind of understanding of the, of the code that's in the Swift file. Right? So we can do things like if we have this, uh, if we have this kind of code in a, in a Swift file that we are analyzing, now, this is what a call to our dependency injection framework looks like. You know, the person that wrote this is trying to inject the implementation of this network requesting protocol. So we can identify the pattern and extract the protocol from here and then do some interesting things with that, like, for example, mock generation. So we can generate a mock to, to feed the dependency injection framework for this automatically. And this is, this is what you do. You know, that's a bit, that's a, a, we generate a basic version of the mock that then the developer can just you know, customize as they need. And we use uh, the Mokolo library from Uber to do this. And you know, again, that's 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 what it looks like. That's what you get in your screen after you're just running these two commands in a, in a couple of in a, in a few seconds. And with this, we uh, we have achieved that you know, any anyone in our team that you know uses these tools is going to uh, have a project that takes less than one minute to compile. This is because they actually have to compile like a very little amount of code compared to, the, to, the all, the, to all of the code that we have. Because as, you, as I showed uh, initially, you know, mo all of the dependencies are actually pointed at this interface uh, modules that have really little amount of code. And you can just, you can just uh, you know, fulfill the needs of your feature with mocks. And these are the tools that we are using to uh, implement all of our new screens using SwiftUI and the tools that, um, that I just wanted to share with you today. So thank you very much. Do you have some type of questions? Excellent talk. Yes, we have some questions from the same person. <laughs> uh, so, uh, do you use mono repo or multiple repos? Um, which one do you prefer? Uh, we we do use a uh, mono, mono repo. Yeah, mono repo. Okay. Uh -huh. Cool. Um, do you have a design system in Rapi, and does it work with Swift UI? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, we do have a design system. You know, it's all written in SwiftUI at the moment. We are, we're actually thinking through how we're going to implement this uh, with, with SwiftUI. You know, we have some options. And we, we don't, I'd actually like to talk of, uh, with the people that, that ask that, because we are, we are dealing with the same issue at the moment. OK. And the last question, at mm -hmm. least for now, uh, besides feature module, what other modules do you have? Um, for instance, do you have a single network module for all feature modules, or each feature has its own? Uh, okay, for, so for the network example, yes. I mean, we just one, you just have one network um, implementation module that's going to fulfill all of your networking needs. Some of the teams have, uh, you know, some custom functionality on top of that, but that that usually goes into the into the feature module that uses that unless it's, it's shared into, you know, with multiple features, in which case we can put it in a different kind of module. OK. And what is your minimum development target? Say again, please. What, what is uh, your minimum development target? Oh, it's IS 14 at the moment. Yeah, I thought I, was, I made it clear at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, and the last one. If Apple backtracks on SwiftUI, will it impact these Modularis modularization strategy. Uh -huh. Do you have a migration strategy for this case? You know, that's really unlikely, but I know <laughs> it's not going to impact our, our modules because we can. You know, it's in the same way that we are using a SwiftUI to you know, this this kind of feature architecture to uh, to use SwiftUI. We can just replace that with UIKit if, if needed. Or Objective C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Paulo. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>